China just left its key policy rate unchanged on Thursday, even despite a faltering economy, which many economists see as a precursor for more stimulus. What is next for not just the Chinese central banks, but any investors interested in investing in China? We're here to discuss Chinese equities and the economy with Brendan Alhern. He is a CIO of CraneShares ETFs, a company that offers a suite of ETFs focused on providing access to China. Welcome to the show. Brendan, good to host you here on the David Lynn Report. Welcome. No, thank you for the opportunity. It's great to reconnect, David. Brendan, let's start with your investment case. Why should someone invest in China right now? Well, certainly we believe right now is an opportunity uh, based on what we see uh, occurring in the second half of the year that China's government will meet at the end of this month. Uh, they have their most senior government officials have a Politburo meeting, which we know uh, kicks off on July 28th and is going to be very focused on the economy. And already in advance of that meeting, we're seeing, we're getting a sense of what the blueprint for stimulus that will be rolled out in the second half of the year will look like just based on some of the announcements that have been coming out. So you gave me a slide deck here. You've got five checklists uh, on China's capital markets, and you've got internet regulation, ADR delisting, zero COVID policy, real estate, and geopolitical risk. Uh, they were red, which indicates high concern. And now uh, they're all green, or at least one is on watch. What's changed? Yeah, we've seen if we were having this conversation a year ago, we'd be talking about those issues. You know, China was in zero COVID. Obviously, that's been removed. Uh, certainly, a lot of people got COVID in China and the consumer is still dealing with some of the scar tissue uh, that was related to zero COVID. So you're seeing the economy come back incrementally. Uh, the PBOC in mid-December said its initial review of Chinese auditors, the U.S. big four accounting companies that audit all the big uh, U.S. and Hong Kong listed China internet companies, they passed that review. Uh, the PCO PCOB is back in Hong Kong as we speak, reviewing the remaining uh, auditors. Um, obviously, Evergrande and other distressed players, while continuing to be a, a weighing on the real estate and property sector, uh, they've not created China's Lehman moment. And if anything, those companies have garnered a significant government uh, focus. Just the Chinese government isn't going to allow that first domino to drop. Um, and then last and last least would be the U.S.-China geopolitical. And certainly we've seen uh, Secretary of State Blinken in China, followed by Secretary of State Yellen. Henry Kissinger and John Kerry were in China this week. Um, and certainly actually you actually had Blinken and the China foreign minister actually met at the G20 uh, meeting. Uh, so you, we see these green shoots on the potential improvement of U.S.-China diplomatic relationships. So all of these have all of these issues, David, have kept investors on the sidelines. And we think now now is an opportunity to come back into this space, especially in light of what we see happening in the second half of this year. The Chinese economy hasn't done well in the last quarter, according to uh, reports um, and their latest data. Now, you mentioned already a few indicators. Uh, the real estate market has slumped somewhat. Um, growth overall has slowed. Exports have come down despite the opening up of the economy post-COVID. And of course, uh, the economy is still um, very much in debt, especially if you're talking about local governments um, and they have to cut down on spending. What does this all mean, though, for the investor? Uh, certainly, the macroeconomic outlook um, is important. Yeah, yeah. And certainly, you know, the, the Chinese economy is coming back that they didn't do uh, helicopter money. There weren't any free checks. So they've been very conservative. And I think ultimately investors have become a little impatient with the China economy that it's being, it's coming back, I'll bet, incrementally and slowly. They've been very conservative. Uh, but we do believe that they're going to loosen the proverbial purse strings in the second half that, you know, already the extended the electric vehicle uh, purchase tax. They've extended that for several years. Uh, they've talked about promoting um, the purchasing of household goods, uh, refrigerators, air conditioners, washers and dryers. So, so they're going to focus on on the domestic consumption story. 
because very simply, the global economy is slowing. So demand from the world's factory is going to slow. And that's that's actually more reflective of the global economy, some of the headwinds it faces. But for China, what what levers can they pull? Well, it's got to be the domestic consumption story because foreign demand is simply going to slacken. Now, now the service sector represents about 50% of China's GDP. So, so we think it, you know, this is where they're gonna focus. And we think we're really well positioned with many of the, you know, internet e-commerce companies that that were invested in. Were you surprised that the central bank did not cut rates this week? You know, the loan prime rate, the one in the five year, which mortgages are built off as, you know, no one no one expected them to cut it. At the same time, that investors in patient is wearing thin. They've they've talked a good story, but where's where's the action? And so so I wasn't surprised, but I there's a small part of me was hoping. Now now they did come back and said that a likely bank reserve requirement ratio cut will take place. But at the same time, they've been, I think they're a little bit worried about this, you know, that the Riambi's weakened, you know, as the US Fed hikes, it's weakening the Riambi. And so, so I think they might hold off on outright cutting interest rates, uh, simply because of the effect it could have. Now, they're certainly keeping monetary conditions very loose, you know, they are definitely quantitative easing, as opposed to tightening. And we think we're going to see some of this fiscal policy support coming. Uh, but looking forward, then, do you think monetary policy will become more accommodative uh, towards the end of the year? Yeah, I mean, I think we track one thing that we recommend uh, investors track is M2. It's actually money supply growth. And and you see that's still running very, very strong. So, so you see this liquidity in the system, which is indicative of this easing bias as well as these loose monetary conditions. So it's something that's very interesting for us, David, is that when we look at a lot of these metrics for China relative to other deve- to developed markets, they're doing the exact opposite. You know, their central banks are tightening, not easing. Uh, they're, they're pulling in, you, know, you actually see M2 shrinking in many countries. Um, and so we think we do think that Chinese equities have not been properly rewarded based on what we see as a pretty strong outlook coming. And what's going to be driving this strength? Which which sectors do you think will be performing the best and driving this growth forward? Well, we think it's definitely the year of the consumer, that the consumer in China has been very conservative post-COVID. Uh, that's some of that proverbial scar tissue. Um, certainly the weakness in property has affected an element of the Chinese household balance sheet. Um, and that's why, you know, things will, some of the curves on real estate investing will come off in the second half of this year. But the number one thing is to get that consumer back out and out spending. And, and I think the, that there are signs of that taking place. If you track the EV sales number for China this year, very, very strong. You know, BYD, you know, is producing more EVs in China annually than Ford does of vehicles globally. So, so, so EVs are showing that with this policy support, it's creating demand. They've said this is going to happen with home appliances, home furnishing. And we think we'll continue to see measures around this domestic consumption story come out. And certainly that we think will happen as early as early August, post this Politburo meeting. Well, the equities markets in China have um, not reflected this optimism, at least not so far this year. Why do you think there was a bifurcation in strength between the Chinese equities and the American stock markets? Well, I think I think the, the many investors have come out of China or have reduced their positions because of the concerns we spoke about. And they're coming back, but slowly. Um, and certainly the U.S. stock market has had just, you know, an incredible performance. And again, that's despite interest rates rising, quantitative tightening, higher valuations. I mean, we think there's just such a huge opportunity because, you know, we believe U.S. tech is probably overpriced. And at the same time, China tech is underpriced. And that's why we just think investors, they need catalysts to come back in 
I mean, you got this pull-up borough meeting. Uh, the companies we hold in our China Internet ETF will report earnings in August. We think those Q2 comparisons, remember Q2 last year was the Shanghai lockdown. They should be able to beat that. And then in beginning of September, you have Alibaba. Alibaba thinks their stock is so cheap, besides buying back stock, they're actually going to break the company up into six different units and deliver those units to shareholders. And that process really begins in the beginning of September. So, so I think there's all the signs of you know, this market is really ripe for investors to come back into. Are you concerned about the RMB, the yuan, depreciating significantly versus the dollar, uh, given that the U.S. Fed is um, is is continuing to hike and the Chinese central bank hasn't hasn't been as hawkish yet, um, or if they're going to be at all, given what we've discussed so far? And I understand that the RMB is a managed flow, but it still trades within a band. So, what what right. are your views on the RMB? Yeah, it's interesting. Earlier this week, the PBOC did intervene. Uh, they basically tapped the brakes on the Riembi's depreciation. When it got up to s- about 725, it's immediately come back here. I mean, I think in the short run, you're having a little bit of a counter trend rally. The dollar is getting a little bit stronger. It's just really based on what does the Fed do? Do we have another hike coming? Do we have two hikes? I think that will really determine you know, what the Riembi is going to do. It's just interest rate differentials, in my opinion, are the main driver of foreign currencies and the PBOC. Um, I think is going to be cautious on how much they cut interest rates because of the depreciation. They don't want to be viewed as a currency manipulator, uh, though arguably they're actually making their currency weaker, but that allows their exports to be cheaper. So I think they're, it's more just the dollar is has been such a wrecking ball versus the Riembi simply because most EM countries are hiking. You know, many developed markets are hiking. China's not. Uh, I want to bring up the other elephant in the room, which is the issue of Taiwan and um, and whether or not China will actually take uh, decisive action in reunification. Uh, certain high-level U.S. military officials have pointed to the possibility of an outright invasion, if not some sort of military force, by as early as 2027 for a whole host of reasons, including the fact that should they wait longer, it'll be more difficult. And Xi Jinping has made that one of his priorities. Uh, at least during his time in power, which could be a while, given that um, you know he's renewed his terms already. So, uh, how is this going to weigh in on the investment landscape? Well, you know, obviously we can't predict the future, um, but you know, we we're skeptics of the you know our brains are hardwired to think China, you know, Ukraine, Russia, China, Taiwan, and you know, if anything, the you know, ex, you know what's happened to Russia. Um, ostracized from the global economy, global financial markets. If you think about China, uh, it's so much more geared to Western economies than Russia. You know, so they have far more to lose by actually invading Taiwan and being cut out of the global financial markets. The mental math just doesn't make sense for them to do so. Um, the, it, our main concern is more that they are provoked into doing something. Um, that, that, you know, many, you know, many, you know, some of the actions you're seeing uh, almost appear to be, you know, wanting to provoke them, uh, where I think, you know, left on their own, they'd simply play the long game, which is that, you know, Taiwan's economic interests over time become more aligned with China than the West. Um, that just makes sense. But again, you know, um, we're more concerned about, you know, Western action toward Taiwan creating a reaction, um, but but if war did break out in the in the over the Taiwan Strait, would that would that be a that that would be a headwind, a major headwind on equities? Would it not? I mean, the, your main concern would be U.S. multinationals that have significant revenue exposure or global multinationals. So think about you know Apple, you know Apple. Their revenue is more than twenty percent from China. If I mean, if that goes to zero, Apple is dro- and how much of Apple's growth is coming out of China? So it's not forget just them manufacturing. So if you take Apple's market cap and think about how much of that market cap is dependent upon China, you'd say more than twenty percent. 
That 20% of market cap represents more, more money than every US dollar invested in China. Um, and ExxonMobil, more than 10%. Think about it, what's Tesla without China? What's Starbucks, Boeing, Caterpillar? Like, you know, it's it's interesting, David. We talked to this investor who said, you know, we're really worried about China, so we're going to buy Japanese stocks. You don't think Japan gets pulled into a regional conflict? <laughs> I mean, there's nowhere to hide. Uh, the U.S. economy, the global economy would crash. And so is the, you know, you, you Chinese equity exposure would be an afterthought. That's based on what would happen to U.S. stock market. You brought up, you brought up uh, Tesla. So yeah, I do want to transition to some of the uh, specific ETFs you have in your suite. Um, cars, let's talk about cars. K-A-R-S, the uh, Crane Shares Electric Vehicles and Future Mobility ETF. That's actually done quite well this year. Um, it's up uh, since the lows in April. It was $28 at $32 US. Uh, it's up on the year, year to date. Now, um, you brought up Tesla. I bring this up because I believe close to 50% of Tesla's global sales come from Chinese markets, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I, I wonder, I, before we talk about Chinese, uh, the Chinese side, I want to talk about the American side first. What does the development of in-house or domestically produced Chinese electric vehicles mean for Tesla? Yeah, for Tesla, I mean, I give Tesla a lot of credit um, that they've been in China. You know, it's amazing. I mean, the, the, the genesis of the Cars ETF was Jonathan Crane, our founder, and I were walking in Beijing and uh, we were walking to a luxury mall and we passed an Apple store. This was in July of 2018. And then we passed a Tesla dealer. And, and Tesla, you know, at the time was a very controversial company. You know, there was doubts about could it survive? And, you know, our belief was, you know, Tesla at a minimum would not just survive in China, but thrive. And that's because government policies have pushed the consumer to have advantages in buying an electric vehicle. Um, and so that's certainly benefited Tesla, but you know, Tesla is a luxury vehicle. And, and I think companies like BYD, um, it's just an incredible story about how the, you know, that company and you know, they started with nothing. They were actually a cell phone battery maker and transitioned to electric vehicles. But they sell, you know, they sell, they make Tesla's output look like a rounding error. I mean, I mean they're doing millions of vehicles, uh, not hundreds of thousands. And then you got these upstarts, the Neos and Xpengs and Li Autos. So, so the, the key here, David, is just in China, an EV doesn't have to be a luxury vehicle that only rich people can buy. Why, why are we seeing those Chinese made EVs on American streets, at least not on mass? Well, the U.S., has made the tariffs have made it uneconomical to import them. Um, and you go anywhere else in the world, David, you go Latin America, Middle East, Europe, Asia, you see BYDs, you see Chinese automakers. The U.S., somewhat contradictory, <laughs> uh, has protected the U.S. auto industry via very, very high tariffs on importation. And the Chinese automakers, I think, you know, they've had these advantages in terms of the whole ecosystem operating in China, um, that they're able to source material, land, they get tax breaks. They would lose those advantages coming here. Uh, so it's a shame. It's 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 a real shame because if you look at follow Neo, what they're doing in Europe is in, it's just outstanding. And BYD, I mean, they've got you know, you don't have to be a millionaire to own a BYD. You know, their new lower end model is um, only about $16,000 US. So economical um, and somewhat paradoxically, you know, the tariffs on importation have prevented, you know, seems like a good opportunity. Well, interestingly, uh, I'm looking at your car's uh, fact sheet, the fun fact sheet, and your top 10 holdings, Tesla, Panasonic, APTIV, uh, Index Corp, um, and a few others. Not all of them are Chinese companies. You've got BYD on there. Samsung's on there as well. Can you walk us through your rationale for selecting some of these stocks? Yeah. So the key, you know, what we, you know, 
you know, obviously we're, you know, sometimes you see trends in China that we think we're going to go global. You know, mobile payments is one of them, right? You know, China's global leader in mobile payment adoption. Um, you know, it's happening slowly here in North America. Um, and we saw what China was doing in the EV, that that was going to happen globally. And, you know, to build an electric vehicle um, is not a unique to China, that it's going to happen, you know, here in the U.S., it's going to happen in Canada, it's going to happen in Europe. But it, but it also takes an ecosystem of global companies. So you have, you know, Chilean uh, lithium providers. You've got, you know, Japanese, you know, Panasonic, you know, big, big player in batteries. Uh, so it is a global phenomenon. CATL, contemporary, an, an incredible Chinese company, largest EV battery maker globally. Um, they, you know, you saw they did a deal with Ford for manufacturing here in the U S recently. Um, so you have, you have this, this is a global phenomenon. And, you know, I think, I think like, listen, I'm a huge believer in Elon Musk and it's incredible what he's done with Tesla. Owning Tesla is not the way, only way to play EV, uh, because you miss out on incredible companies like BYD, CATL, Panasonic. Uh, as well as downstream beneficiaries in terms of some of these miners. I'm surprised Tesla is even on this list, let alone the top holding. Are you are you betting on expansion in China even more than what they've already done? Well, we believe that Tesla will continue to survive and thrive in China, just as China's urban middle class continues to grow. Um, certainly, Tesla is a luxury goods. You know, it's a high end, high price vehicle. So I think they'll continue to do well just as China's economy moves along and more people get rich in China. Um, at the same time, we think that that there's opportunities in the U.S. to go beyond just the luxury goods market. And I think that's something we'd like to see Tesla do. We, we hope it's something Tesla will learn from China is create a version that the middle class or the average Chinese person or average American can actually afford. And, and the reality is the average American cannot afford a Tesla. So if we want to meet some of these climate, these climate goals, we're going to need more EVs. And you know, we think getting EVs into more garages create a lower risk model. The problem, the problem in the US, it's just too expensive. It's just too expensive. How do you feel about the chip makers, the Taiwan semi manufacturing company, T, uh, TSMC, NVIDIA, uh, a few others? They're not on your list, um, at least not on the top 10 holdings, uh, but certainly they play a role in the EVs, right? Yeah, certainly certainly those companies will be beneficiaries, but as a percentage of their revenue thus far, it's, it's not overly high. There's other tech plays uh, that are better ways that are more, you know, this, this, the index that cars makes investable is about what is the relevancy of the revenue stream to the EV phenomenon. And so, yes, you know, people throw NVIDIA and Taiwan semi, but um, into the EV conversation, but you know, the reality is it's not a big driver at this point. Um, you know, it's more electronics and others. Yeah. Pun intended. It's not driving the uh, electric car company sector yet. So uh, let's talk about uh, KWeb, the other big ETF uh, that you have in your in your portfolio. KWeb is an e-commerce and internet-based uh, ETF. Again, let's let's walk through what happened so far. Not a great year for the price. Um, what happened? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, all of those risks we outlined really brought people out of the KWeb companies. Um, and so that's how you know one of the reasons why when China announced unexpectedly coming out of zero COVID, you, you know, K1 went up almost a hundred percent. And uh, you know, many people would say, well, you know, the geopolitical the balloon incident, you know, that kind of took the wind out of the K Web rally. But really the K Web rally kind of stalled out in mid to late uh January of this year when the US dollar got very, very strong. Uh, relative to the RMB, acted a bit of a headwind for risk assets, including Chinese equities like KWeb. So we think we think we're getting a little bit of a pullback here, but we are we are optimistic. I mean, uh, for the second half for the KWeb companies, they all report in August again Q2 earnings, 
you know, very easy comparison to Q2 last year when Shanghai was in lockdown. So again, and then more measures geared to China's consumers. How do Chinese consumers consume? Through the companies in KWeb. What can you, can you, what's the impact on the U.S. dollar uh, on, on, uh, on, on Chinese tech companies? Can you explain that relationship? So it's interesting. So the companies within KWeb, bless you, are predominantly Hong Kong and U.S. dollar denominated. So you'd say there's no factor that they're in dollars and the Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the U.S. dollar. There is an effect, though, because the underlying companies are in China, right? They they derive their revenue in the RMB. So if the RMB is worth less, those companies are worth less. So that's where, while there's no exact currency exposure to the RMB, it is a little bit of an implied. Uh, but most of their sales are domestically in China? 100%, yeah. Okay. Interesting. You know, we see uh, American companies being uh, global in their scope in terms of e-commerce. I'm talking about things like Amazon. Um, why isn't the Chinese counterpart um, similar uh, in, in their reach? Well, you know, these companies have are, are not preordained winners. They've gotten to where they are in China through this incredibly competitive market. Um and and they've you know, ridden that. You know, when they go overseas, and you know, now they face competition from you know global domestic players. So so they lose a little bit of the advantages there. You know, they do. They are going overseas. You know, Alibaba has Lazada. It's a e-commerce out of uh, in Southeast Asia. You know, Ten Cent owns a piece of Epic Games. Uh, Trip.com bought Bookrunner, which was a European travel online travel agency. So the companies have gone overseas, but really incrementally today, most of the revenue is very much geared to to China. Uh, but you are seeing it's interesting. You know, this company Sheen, this fast fast retailer, has done very well in the United States. Uh, Pin Duo Duo is doing a push for Temu. Um, here in the U.S., so so it's interesting. Some you know some of these companies have quietly done well, particularly Sheen, the um, clothing you know clothing geared to young people. Um, it's done really really well. Yeah, how how has Alibaba been doing? Uh, you know, we we know about Jack Ma uh, as as uh, his um, um, eccentric nature, and I don't know has he has he disappeared? What happened to him? I haven't following up the recent. A recent tale of Jack Ma. Where is he? So yeah, he's been. You know, he's popped up. You know, he was in Japan. Uh, he was back in China. Um, you know, I think. I think the key. You know, he's he has really stepped away from the company itself. Um, and so we think it's very interesting. You know, Alibaba. I, th I think. You know, I think the revenue since their IPO is up 10x, and yet the stock is flat. And so it just shows how much investors have come, those concerns, they've come out of the names. And um, we think ultimately, you know, the company is going to take these six major units and spin those off and IPO them for shareholders. So we think it's very, very shareholder friendly what they're doing. Well, that, that brings me to my next point, which is that you got a slide here showing the PE ratios of internet companies in the US versus China. Uh, American internet companies, according to your chart, currently trading in the 40, uh, 40 times multiple. Uh, Chinese companies, on average, trading at half of that, um, 22.5 PE. Now, there's two ways to interpret this. One, Chinese internet companies are grossly undervalued compared to the U.S. Mm -hmm. counterparts, or that Amer uh, people are just paying a premium for a better quality company, which is the U.S. company. How would you interpret this? Well, I think I think you've got a bit of um, you know, there's been a true detachment from the underlying fundamentals uh, for both U.S. on the upside. And, and sorry, and China. I, I will note I will note that your chart uh, started off with both of these lines kind of converging um, as of December of 2022. So it's really diverged over the course of this year. But yeah, please, please, yeah, why, yeah. I mean, continue. these these issues drove investors out of the. And so that that's created this incredible uh, valuation disparity, and I think things like AI and 
you know, I'm a believer, you know, it's going to, but you know, the, the valuations, of some of these companies are just so detached. And I think there's a little bit of a FOMO occurring in U S equities and U S tech. Um, it's, it's hard to predict what, what ends that. Uh, but I do think the significant discount in, um, you know, Chinese tech, it's, it is an opportunity for investors. Okay. Um, well, we you have a lot of ETFs um, in your product suite. We don't have time to go over all of them. We can save a few more for a conversation for another time. I'll put a slide up here and, and uh, people watching this can uh, visit your fact sheets um, individually. Uh, let's close off on this thought. Um, the Chinese stock market has been volatile over the last 10 or 15 years. The, uh, the We saw an A shares bubble not too long ago that popped. Uh, and now, as we've discussed, the Chinese market has lagged behind the American market, at least for 2023. What are some of the biggest misconceptions that investors have about investing in the Chinese capital markets? Yeah, yeah. I think I think sometimes investors have a very short memory. And maybe, maybe that's just because I'm getting older. Uh, but I think, I think, you know, this misnomer that, you know, China's had a lost decade, um, you know, you know, what we believe is of such a major factor is if you looked at MSCI China and MSCI Emerging Markets, 10 years ago, 50% of those two benchmarks were in financials and energy. And so you basically had MSCI China and MSCI Emerging Markets were value proxies in a decade of growth stock outperformance. Tech was only 11% of emerging markets and 2% of China. But the S&P 500, this is from the March 2009 low through uh, mid-July. The S&P was up, call it 800%. MSCI Emerging Market was up 200% and MSCI China 150. But if you actually owned the that smaller piece of EM tech, it went up over 900%. So if you own that one mu- small part of EM tech, you actually beat the S&P 500. And in the case of China tech, which was only 2% of the benchmark, it went up nearly 2,000%, 1,800%. You ran, you did more than twice what the S&P 500 did, right? So so that's what what Crane Shares is about. It's about giving you that growth element within China, as well as broader emerging markets. Uh, A final question. How do you think the current set of five-year plans uh, are conducive to capital markets growth? Now, I think China has, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Xi Jinping has pivoted away from the growth at any cost or all cost strategy. And is now, uh, I'm not saying economic growth is not one of their priorities, but they've started to prioritize some other things too that haven't popped up before, like green energy and um, social security, economic energy and security. Um, yep. And so these things, some may say, would be indicative of, let's say, slower growth in China over the next decade compared to, let's say, the 2000s. Uh, would you say that this is still an opportunity for capital markets growth in light of this environment? Yeah, we're big believers that, you know, yes, I mean, listen, the days of double digit GDP growth are behind us, simply the law of large numbers. Um, so the value of GDP growth has never been larger for China, but just on a percent basis, right? You know, Q2 was 6%, a little more than 6% year over year, which is still an outstanding number. But more importantly, if we looked at the value of that 6% growth, it was larger than the annual growth when China was growing at 20%, you know, 20 years ago. Um, so the value, the value of growth is what's key. And I think in terms of you know, China's capital markets continue to grow. Um, you know, they continue to have a robust domestic IPO market. So I think there's still a commitment to the opening up for foreign investors, for foreign companies operating in China. Um, we do still see that taking place. But yeah, to your point, David, it's a good observation on your part. You know, things like addressing wealth inequality are important to China. And you know, this idea of common prosperity, it's, you know, we have a progressive income tax, right? Well, tell me how that's not, you know, similar to common prosperity. So, so yes, there's other factors that are at play. I mean, that's part of clean energy, 
is people in China got sick and tired of the pollution and the government's actually done things to address it. There's actually, um, there's actually uh, these startups I've seen in Canada that sell bottled clean air uh, and they yeah. ship it over to China. Um, I, I don't know how that company's doing, but yeah, people are sick and tired of pollution and there's a, there's a solution to that as well. Thank you very much, Brendan, for coming on the show. I appreciate your insights in China. We'll follow up and talk about some more sectors next time. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, it's great to reconnect. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.